probably many of you don't know me. I um, I used to uh, help organize um, Aula at some point. Um, we had the idea of making um, the value of Aula a bit more educational and, and interesting. Um, it was a good idea that I did that. I got hired into my um, current company uh, because um, one of the attendees um, thought I was uh, really cute. Um, you are? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't Martin Eckert, by the way, if you have any um, doubts. And um, I've been involved with uh, Agora for the past two years, uh, working with uh, Atteli, uh, which is a startup they um, acquired. And uh, before that, I uh, won a seat camp uh, with Codility. And then I moved to London. Being, so I've been being our employee in our consultancy. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've been in London since then. And um, Arthur asked me to uh, basically say a few things about what I learned uh, that differs the, the, the Polish or the Eastern European um, technological space and then the startup community from, um, from uh, the Western or the London, uh, where I have the most experience. Um, can I get a ticker for the slides? Yep. Uh, so it's going to be a bit edu educational, hopefully, uh, a bit boring, uh, but maybe we can suffer through Just 20 minutes. No. All right, you can't really understand uh, the differences between Poland and other countries without understanding the background. And um, the background is that in, in Poland, the free economy has about 20 years, and, um, and the free economy in, in, in the Western world has a couple hundred. Um, and because of that, the companies that we have, the brands that we have right now, just don't have a clue what they're doing. Um, they're trying to learn from our Western counterparts, but we don't have uh, the deep um, culture and institutions that will support entrepreneurship. Even our legal system is not really uh, on par with what the venture capital investment or, 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 uh, or uh, the trade sales, the uh, IPOs require for uh, technological companies. On the other hand, can I switch the slide, please? Yep. On the other hand, we have companies that have been operating uh, for hundreds of years sometimes um, as the same company. So if you think about the amount of experience that they have, the, uh, the, the culture within the organizations that they have, that they are basically launching against you uh, coming out of Eastern Europe, um, it's, it's just something that you can't uh, discount and you can't think that you can uh, basically catch up because you have an iPhone or, or an iPad and, and you are already there, you know, you're driving the same car or whatever, but you have to understand that the, the, the knowledge that they have acquired over those years, um, they are actually using against you. So that's the, the background. And it's important because we are actually creating this background for the years to come. So uh, you as the, as the entrepreneurs that will shape the economy in, in, in Poland and in, and in Eastern Europe are basically building the things that the, the, the people coming after you will be using. Can we switch the slide? Please. This is going to be yep. really annoying. Okay, so the, 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 the most important comp, uh, component of, of building a company are the people that are actually starting it. And this is something that I see as, a, um, as an important difference between the people that, that start companies in Poland and... Oh, by the way, um, Arthur asked me not to offend anyone during my speech. I thought it's quite odd. I mean, why ask me to speak if not to offend anyone? But, um, so I'm not offending anyone in particular with, with what I'm saying. If you feel offended, I was probably thinking about you when I was creating the slide, but in general, I didn't mean anything, anything personal. Um, <laughs> Don't so yeah, margin, please. The people. Let's go on. The people that start companies often in Poland, or companies, uh, we'll, we'll talk about companies as well, are, can we see the slide? Maybe I'll wave my hand like that and that will mean switch the slide, all right? Probably not. Um, okay, so the people that start companies in Poland, um, I call them angry employees. Because the, the first thing that they will tell you in an interview or something like that is, I don't want to work for anyone. I want to be my own boss. I want to decide for myself. And this is not really what an entrepreneurship or an entrepreneur is about. Un entrepreneurs are fixing the world. They are filling the gaps in the world with the products that they create. And, uh, and this really also reflects uh, when you're hiring someone uh, in Poland that is really good at what they're doing, 
Um, they're not going to want to work for a company because they're already thinking about starting their own company because they don't want to be working for anyone else. And it's incredibly frustrating because uh, it doesn't mean that people are doing technology or doing startups because they are really creating value or want to fi fix problems. They want to either get rich, uh, which is not really a good path to getting rich, you know, this whole entrepreneurship thing, uh, or, or they don't want to work for anyone else. They want to manage their own time and so on and so on. Uh, whereas in uh, the company, the people that I meet that are starting companies in, in, in the UK, <laughs> it's not really working, this thing. Um, they are, they are the founders. So they they spent years working for Google, Yahoo, or Goldman Sachs. They went to Boy Scouts. They have British intelligence on their CVs. They're just very well prepared. They spent times the time developing themselves as uh, as entrepreneurs. Um, and part of that is just basic signaling. So you're telling, hey, investor, I spent years at Google. So you know it's a kosher company. Just please invest in me. Part of it is the network that you develop working for big companies and you know you leave Google for instance, you start your own startups and then you go to Google to hire people. Very simple thing. But you also have uh, networks within the, uh, the industry that a big company helps you develop a lot faster than if you are just running a small web agency or whatever else. And another important component is that you earn serious money. If you work for Google or for Microsoft for a couple of years, maybe not in Poland, but somewhere else, um, you make serious money. And this money allows you to not work for 12 months, for instance. And this is something that the, the, the young founders in Poland can't really afford, is just go jobless for a year or two while they're working on their own startup. So they don't have to do any consulting on the side or anything like that. They can just focus on, on building their company. Switch. All right, so the companies. How the companies look in Poland versus uh, somewhere else? Switch. All right, so in Poland, a company is a project. It, it's great, I mean, you've got a bunch of random people, the guy on the side, on the right side, the, no one really knows what he's doing, you know, the girl on the left wants to pee, uh, there is some product, the business model is completely wrong, if it's even there, it's just a random stuff. Uh, not offending anyone again. Um, can you switch? Whereas, uh, yeah, yeah, the company enterprise. Yeah, the company on the West is an enterprise, but not this one. Yeah, it's a corporation. Um, and, you know, it has the team, it has a product, it has, it, it's already incorporated as a company. Um, and, and, you know, there is the whole package that is ready to invest by investors, that is, um, has some credibility with uh, the commercial partners that are going to work with you. And it's just a full thing. Um, and, for someone that is just starting a company, uh, like, for instance, I, I launched a product last year um, called Link Finder. It was great. We were two people having fun, uh, got some traction. It could have gone somewhere, but it wasn't going in the direction that we were interested in, so we decided to kill it. At the same time, um, similar guys were starting uh, Clicked, I think, in, uh, uh, in the UK. They had a team of four people with great uh, technical backgrounds. They were incorporated, that they had an advisory board, and uh, they got funded. They got a little money, uh, but just enough to um, keep them running, and they are iterating around a very similar business model. Um, we never got there because LinkFinder was, was always a project. They s thought about it as a company from the start, and they are a company, and they're going to probably build a business or at least burn some investor money. Money, that's a, another uh, topic. How acquiring money works in Poland and how acquiring money works somewhere else. Um, the, the people that you get the money from in Poland, um, I call them lenders. So even if they call themselves investors, angels, whatever, uh, the, there, is a, there is a mentality of actually borrowing you money rather than investing into you. Um, some of the companies that I talk to about you know, potential investment and so on in Poland um, have investors, but when you look at actually how the investment is structured, it's, it's very often a, more of a loan to the company rather than, uh, than a real um, investment. And you need to understand where this comes from. There is just not enough money in the market. Uh, when, uh, for, for instance, when a family fund invests in a, uh, in a venture capital fund, they will only invest 1% of the total amount of money into that fund. When a rich person invests into several companies, they only invest about 1-2% per company 
um, because they they have you know a lot of money that they can slice into various risky projects and and then get a return on, on their investment. If someone in Poland has made you know 10 million zlotys, for instance, which is you know a considerable amount of money, and you take one percent of that, how much can they really afford to invest? Which means that there is a logic of protecting protecting their wealth uh, rather than risking it to, um, to to you know to create something new. It's just a matter of the amount of money that's available in the market, and um, and, and, and because there is more money in uh, in Western markets, you have you know professional investors, and these professional in investors, you know, they are super nice guys, you know, smiling. They will tell you they love their pro your product. They are very happy to talk about it, um, but they are also quite skilled. And this is something that you also need to understand that you, when you're talking to a Polish investor, for instance, they will impose hard terms on you and so on and so on, but it's all out there. When you're talking to, um, to a Western investor, they're super nice until something goes wrong. And then there is a huge um, asymmetry of information be between how they understand the putting money into your company and how you understand it. And the, the whole legal um, system that they are putting behind it can hurt you just because they have 60 years of, of experience in doing that and, and you simply don't. Um, now, why I wanted to cover that is that uh, is because you need to understand that the, 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 situ the investment situation in Poland is not because people are bad people. There's just less money here than it is um, out there. Uh, but also that you need to understand that you, need, you want to go for the money somewhere else, but these people know a lot more about investing than, um, than you do. So, you know, you probably need to um, have some advisors or, 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 um, or a good lawyers that will make sure that you don't get hurt along the way. And yes, relationships. How people approach relationships in Poland and how people approach relationships there. Uh, in Poland, relationships are very much about transactions. So, you know, I've got a product, it's a good product, you know, it costs you, it's going to cost you about 100 zlotys, please buy. Please buy now. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it's okay for some products if you're dealing drugs, and you probably don't want to have a very long-term relationship with a client. Um, but if you are uh, working uh, with someone that's going to keep spending money with you for the next, uh, you know, 50 years or, or until the end of the life of the company, you need to work on the relationship, on the partnership, and not try to sell them something on day one. Um, I have, uh, as a corporate, I have uh, a, a good example of a company that I've been talking to for a year and a half now. Uh, we were about to do a deal, it never happened, uh, you know, everyone was super excited, almost signed it, never happened. There was never a sense of resentment from them or, or um, anything that made me feel that they uh, feel let down by me and not by not managing to close the deal. Um, they are very you know, optimistic about doing it, this in the future because they know that they are investing um, in a relationship with me and in the business that we'll be doing for the next 20 or 30 or 50 years. Sometimes it's not between me, the, the, the company that I work for and the, their company, it's going to be between me and that salesperson. It's building the, the partnerships and relationships that's gonna last for a long, long time. It took me about two years to start having any relationships in, uh, any, any partnerships, real partnerships in London. So when you're going there for a trade event or whatever else, and people don't start buying on day one, remember that you know, the next time you come, go out for a coffee with them, you know, catch up, um, just make sure that they like you and that there is some partnership going on and some relationship going on rather than trying to sell them every single time you see them. Okay, and then selling. Uh, there is a difference between how the close is done by, a, a, by an Eastern European company and how it's done by a Western company. When an Eastern European company is approaching, they are basically in for the kill. Now, it's a great way to end up in a history book uh, and dead. It's probably not that good way of uh, actually making business. The problem is that when you are really aggressive about selling right now, when you get rejected, it's really hard to come back. Whereas if you're just <laughs> polite and persistent, it's gonna turn out for, uh, for good. Um, when, uh, 
When I started uh, working for, with Atedi in, uh, in the UK, um, I, I, you know, we, the basic goal was to approach the, the, the publishing companies. And I started by going there and trying to you know, close the sale every time, uh, which means that I very often heard a hard no. And with the problem with a hard no, and, and that's the problem that uh, Eastern, Euro uh, Eastern European entrepreneurs have, is that when you, you know, when you run with full strength, you really try to sell and you hear a no, it's really hard to come back. It's really hard to build on the, on the meeting that you have on the, or on the relationship that you, that you had. Uh, whereas if you, you know, start warming up the, the subject and you just politely keep reminding them, you know, two weeks later, three weeks later, a month later, that you're still there, still interested in closing the sale, when they will be ready, when they will actually have the budget for your uh, solution, the, the, the decision power to, to make it happen, um, you're going to close the sale. Uh, whereas if you just you know, run with a spear, you might just stab yourself along the way. So, uh, to wrap it up, um, just a couple lessons that probably are not for you, because I'm not, I wasn't really offending you with any of that, but for the people that you are going to talk to, because you are the trendsetters of the entrepreneurship in Poland, right? Remember that we are, long, we are working on stuff that is long term. We are basically developing the um, entrepreneurial and commercial culture of the of the country and of the region for the years to come and for you know if, if we are going to develop and properly work with our employees uh, remember that your children or the children of your children are going to work for those for these people and you know you want to create an environment that is going to be supportive for you know the next hundred or 200 years um, remember that it's all about you as entrepreneurs and develop yourself because of the signaling that you're going to have with investors, because of the raising money, because of the networks that you're going to need to, um, to run your companies, or because of the money that you're going to you know, need to survive for the next year if no one is investing and no one is buying. Uh, remember to create full packages that are um, commercially viable, you know, full companies with teams, with advisory boards, something that it looks solid even if you know, you're just still working out of the garage of your parents. Uh, remember about the differences um, among investors um, and, uh, and make sure that you don't discount investors in Poland because they have different approach to risk and that you don't get stabbed by investors in uh, somewhere else uh, just because they are nice when you start talking to them. Um, build up you know, connections that will last uh, for the next 20 or 30 years and not connections that can just get you something and get you some revenue um, next month. And, you know, have patience and have confidence because uh, eventually uh, this will end up as, uh, as sales. And thank you very much. Perfect. Perfect timing. Thank you, Marcin. Uh, do you have questions for Marcin? Once again? Yes, we have one. Liz Tomic, did I see you right? All right. Oh, Milos, hello. Please speak up. Uh, you mentioned... Uh, wait, 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 wait. Hi Martin, you've mentioned the fact that you need to have a lot of persistence while um, while doing business. Um, does it polite persistence? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so does it apply mainly to startup technology type of businesses, or or if you, for example, like my company, try to do business with I don't know Tesco, would you? Would I you think still, I would think you still have to behave in a way that, that you just said. Uh, you know, I have the experience on both sides of the fence. I tried as a startup to sell to um, other startups and to corporates um, and I was on the, let's say, receiving end as a corporate. And, uh, and on both ends it works the same. Of course, if you are a startup selling to other small businesses and the value of the transactions um, is, is relatively low, you have to basically you know, measure your resources. You can't invest a year of going to lunches with someone that's eventually going to convert into a 100 euro per month uh, customer. Um, so, you know, you have to basically manage your time, but uh, yeah, I think it's applicable on, on any uh, size of the business. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Yep. Oh, Alex. So I love when someone takes out the knife and starts like hacking everyone. Uh, what, what would you advise companies here? Like, should startups stay in Poland and build a business here? 
or should they move to some other country in Western Europe? Well, I think the first thing is, what does it mean to move? To move, uh, like to move, like to live in London, like you do. It was a rhetorical question, but um, <laughs> uh, the, you know, you you can you can move the, the 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 front side, or you know, one of the founders to um, to to Berlin or to London uh, to make sure that you have good relationships with investors, that you know, be whether wherever your market is, start building a commercial and sales team there. But make sure that your technical team stays, stays in Poland because it's going to be way cheaper, way faster to acquire talent, and just more of it. Um, so you know you don't you don't really need to move your whole company somewhere else. Uh, but with regards to whether you should stay in Poland, I think there are very 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 few businesses that can remain uh, in Poland and be successful uh, globally in the. In the in the long run, um, we have uh, the example of Red Sky and and FilesTube, uh, where they mm, you know it's it's a pure B two C play. Um, they don't really need that many relationships, selling you know, partner building, um, and so on. But I think it's it, it's an edge case in in most of the, with most of the companies that are built in Poland, and also most of the companies that are um, that are finalists uh, today. Um, your your business partners are going to be somewhere else, and you need to be where uh, where your business partners are. This is my father made this mistake with uh, his company. He basically you know stayed behind his desk, and his salespeople were uh, meeting the the clients and uh, and basically managing those relationships. And the business went nowhere after some time because he lost touch with the market. You need to be as a founder, you need to be very close to your market, and you need to understand it, especially in the first. Two or three years of the of the company, when you are um, basically trying to figure out what your product is going to be before you start scaling it and so on. All right, thank you, Martin. Anyone else? Arthur, just extending the question because um, I know that founders of a daily remained in Poland, and basically after two years they decided to withdraw from UK market. Do you think it was the mistake that they moved you, not themselves? Um, because it was just what you said. No, no, a daily didn't. Uh, didn't try to really um, work on the UK market. We were trying to develop it um, across Europe, and um, and it wasn't a matter of the founders that didn't go somewhere, uh, but rather the resources that we had for actually doing that. The commercial execution went, went quite well. Um, the, the the resources that we had to actually you know finish it uh, were not there and, and, and the Polish market was qu quite lucrative at, at this time and, um, and we developed it. Peter. Hi Peter, Peter Script Venture. Uh, so I'm sorry if I might have missed that from your presentation but when did you actually close the first deal in London and what was the whereabouts of the deal? Uh, the, first, the first one for Ateli uh, so I started working for Atelier in, I think, January. The first implementation that we had was at least six months after that. At least, I don't, I don't properly remember, but the first one was at least six months, uh, somewhere over the summer. That was also uh, connected with the product, so we didn't really have the product until, um, I think, May. Um, so there was a slight delay there, but I don't think we could have made it any faster if, um, if, uh, if, even if we had the product. It just took, it just takes time. But was it like a big time deal or just the first one? No, it was the first time to, it was a big publisher, uh, definitely, but it was just the first thing that we managed to do. No, I, I think we can move the, the discussion to yes. either uh, just after the event or...